You're getting two tests back, the test on chapter 6 and the chest, uh, test on chapter 7. And some of you did not ding zheng. So if you did not correct the mistakes that you made, especially for the test on chapter 6, please do so and hand it in on Monday, okay? Any tests that you haven't done the corrections for. So here's vowels and consonants, chapter 13. As usual, we're going to start off with vowels and consonants. And do you have any questions? Do you have any questions on vowels and consonants? Chapter 6. Okay. Dig it out. Any questions or lots of questions? Thirty-five? Fifty-five. For the nasals, mm -hmm. is this because we close our mouth so it's uh, less louder? That's right. Um, but for an, on a spectrogram, we can still see, for example, for rank, mm -hmm. we can see that um, the second and third formants comes closer. They come together, right? Yeah, so that's, um, is that part of a consonant or is that part of a vowel? Because the consonant should be. Um, the, the part that we, can, we can't see clear when the mouth closed. You'll still see it, but there are a couple of things going on with nasals, two major things. Number one is the amplitude's going to be lower because men mm -hmm. Another thing is there's something called anti-resonances. resonance because it's men It's not just because We've got our mouth closed, but it actually cancels out some of the some of the um, formant information. So you need to be able to see it because when you have a nasal, you're taking away some of the resonances. I, I would have to show you it's an anti-resonance. I'd have to show you in a book and go over it step by step. But those are reasons why you'll find blanks. You'll find just blanks. Those are anti-resonances because that resonance has been canceled out by the way the sound wave is going through your, your vocal tract. So back to your question, sorry. Um, when you're coming up to a velar sound, doesn't matter if it's K or NG or, or G, any of them. If you're getting up to a velar sound, we get what we call velar pinch. And velar pinch is one of our good friends. Because as soon as you see the so-called velar pinch, pinch the jazz series. As soon as you see velar pinch, you know you've got a velar. And when we start reading spectrograms, we need every reliable bit of information we can. And the velar pinch is one of the most reliable pieces that we have. It's among the very reliable pieces of information. So when you're getting closer to a K, a G, or an NG sound, an angma, formant 2 and formant 3 are going to get closer together and they will finally merge. Right. So when you see it getting really light, that is the actual nasal. But because your tongue and all of your organs are getting ready to produce that sound, during the vowel, you're going to see it pretty clearly. It's going to be heading in that direction. When it actually closes, then you'll see suddenly the lines look much lighter. So the velar pinch is part of a vowel that tell us it's a constant, a velar consonant coming. When they, when they are actually together, you're at, the, you're at the consonant. When they actually come together, you're at the consonant. But you're going to see them heading to, together. They're going in the same direction, like they're going to come together. That often happens during the vowel. When they actually come together, you're at the consonant. OK? Anything else? Uh, the examples given on page 51 mm -hmm. um, are bab, dad, and gag. Right. And I wonder because we don't usually voice the initial in English, so uh, can we tell them tell the difference from the uh, spectrogram because they are not usually voiced, or is this example actually the voice one? Oh, well, first of all, with all voiced sounds, you usually get a voice bar at the bottom, and there was a page in the book where they showed you that. 
First of all, you have to keep in mind, and we're not really to this part in the textbook yet. 尺度会不一样. This is going up to 4,000 hertz. Sometimes we go all the way up to 8,000 hertz, and that's going to compress them so we'll see everything less clearly because everything will be squished together. Just so you know that for background. Um, if you see regular vertical vibrations, then it's voiced. So if you see it, and there's a voice bar there, so then it's voiced. So they probably voiced them. Yeah, bab, dad, gag. They probably voice them because they want to tell you or want to show you what it looks like when you've got a voice consonant, voice stop. Okay, yeah. um, and what about the, um, if the stop is unreleased, can we see it from the spectrogram as well? Like put, unreleased will be at the end of a syllable, right? So put, it will suddenly cut off. You see a blank because you get silence. Or if it's voiced, you will see that it's cut off, but you will still see a voice bar at the end. For example, dad, that will still make a voice bar down here. Right? That makes sense? Yeah. Good. Okay, anybody else? Anybody? We talked about pigeons and creoles, and some of you did some searching. When I told you about motu, I couldn't think of the first word. I knew there was a first word there, and some of you did check. It's hiri motu. I don't think I said it in class because I couldn't think of hiri right away, and I wasn't sure. But this is called police motu. It's the main language of Papua New Guinea. At least it has been in the past. Motu is an Austronesian language of Papua New Guinea. And it became a lingua franca of the local languages for everybody to communicate with each other. And motu, although it's on Austronesian, motu fen liangzong. One is Austronesian motu and one is Papuan motu. Now, why would we say Papuan motu when motu is Austronesian? You realize those are two totally unrelated language families, right? Everybody <coughs> know what I'm talking about? Austronesian is Nandao Yu Xi, which we believe originated in Taiwan and then spread out to many, many, especially islands. And motu, or Austronesian languages also ended up in Papua New Guinea, but they also had a lot of their native languages which are not related to Austronesian. I don't know if they're all related to each other. I don't know if we really know that, but we just call those Papuan. And then the new ones that came in, you find them more commonly along the coast because they came in later. People on boats came in and brought the Austronesian languages to Papua New Guinea. And the one that they agreed on for their for their national language and lingua franca for people to learn so they could talk with each other because remember there were over 800 languages in Papua New Guinea was Motu which is Austronesian and they call it Hiri Motu, Hiri is police because the way it spread so far in Papua New Guinea was through, it was called the constabulary that means the police people who were governing the place, who were enforcing the law um, I think I wrote down what they were called. They were called the Royal Papua Constabulary. It was, it was a, a, a colony then. They were enforcing the law, and that's what they spoke, and that spread among the people. So that's how Motu became the lingua franca, a franca and they called it Hiri, they call it police Motu because it was the police who were spreading it around. But the reason they divided up into Austronesian and Papuan Motu is because if your native language is some Austronesian language, then they will say you speak Austronesian Motu. If your native language is some Papuan language, then they say you speak Papua Motu. It's based on what your native language is. So people who speak Minayu at home completely and people who grew up in a Juan, will their Mandarin be a little bit different? A bit different, right? Well, that's the situation here. Okay? So if your home background is Papuan, then you speak Papua Motu, a uh, Papuan Motu. And that was dominant in colloquial motu for a while, according to what I read. This is from Wikipedia. Um, but Austronesian motu was considered more formal and more literary and more high prestige. Okay, so that's the difference. And then there are people whose native language is motu. That's also different from hiri motu. They didn't learn, for example, they weren't forced to learn Mandarin in school. They weren't forced to learn Motu. They just learned it at home. So if somebody comes from Beijing, and then they grow up speaking Beijing, Beijing Mandarin with their parents, is that exactly like the Mandarin that we speak on the street? 
No, so that's similar too. There are some people who grew up with Motu as their native language. It's sort of like the Beijing Mandarin of Papua New Guinea. Does everybody understand what I'm saying? Motu was one of the original languages, an Austronesian language. Some people grew up, or grow up still, in families where they speak Motu at home. So their Motu is going to be a little different from the lingua franca, franca hiri Motu. And you'll notice it. Not a huge difference, but there's a difference. And then Austronesian Motu and Papua and Motu, they will be slightly different. That's what I learned on, on Wikipedia, actually, about when I was looking up Hiri Motu. So that's what the language is called. I thought of that because I couldn't think of Hiri in that class. All right, anything else on vowels and consonants? Yeah. The number of frequency they give us, is that the number for all the people, or is the number for Peter Lord folk? What page are you on? Uh, for example, on page 57, the mm -hmm. frequency is for fricatives. Is that every people have um, um, the frequency between 3,000 and 4,000 for F, uh, for F, or is it just for Peter Lord focus? Oh, it's going to depend because it's going to be higher for women and then a bit lower for men, probably. Everything is going to be lower for men, and then everything will be a bit higher for women overall. So I'm going to get to where you wouldn't be in. Yeah. So this is basically the data of Peter Lodfog. Yes, but when they collect data on formants, they will collect two bodies of data, one for females and one for males. And they will be different. Actually, well, they'll take an average of the three formants among women, and then an average of the three formants among men. And we get an average, and those are fairly consistent. Each person will be a little different. Always remember, though, that your formants are not really related to F0, the fundamental frequency. They're related to the goats out of your, of your vocal tract, what your tongue is doing, etc. So just keep in mind, those are two separate things. But yes, he would be representative of the lower end for males. Yeah. Okay? I'm just wondering, does the frequencies have any relation with it says in fricative that the energy is scattered over the higher frequency. And so the sh, sh is more audible. 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 Right. But in H, it says H. H. Mm -hmm. It's actually the res resonance of the whole vocal jack will be more prominent. And I'm wondering which one is more louder. Oh. When they say the resonance of the whole vocal tract will be more prominent, it doesn't mean more prominent than s or sh. What they mean is, resonances. But s and sh, it doesn't mean that it's louder than H's. It just means that H will give you more information about the whole vocal tract, and S and SH won't give you as much information because they, they happen in the front. So as in S and SH, uh, does their frequencies have any relation with loudness? With and loudness, bluetooth? oh, OK. Um, It has more relation with how the fricative is created, how it's formed. Because with s, it's also hitting against the teeth. Okay, with s, it's hitting a surface and then coming out. So s is very quiet. S, because of the way it's produced, we've got frication between the tongue and the palate, and then it's hitting the teeth as well. So that's creating more friction. That's a wide range of frequencies that are pretty high. It's not necessarily the case that a high frequency will be louder or softer. It doesn't have to be. Does that answer the question? It just happens to me and they have more. Men, men the way we produce them. We use a lot of energy and we've got a lot of surfaces there that the air is hitting and making a lot of noise off of. Right. You can produce a very high pitch with a very low with a very low um, amplitude. 
That, that takes care of it? Good, okay. However, there's one thing that I saw in one book that Latifoget has an address, and I asked him in an email, and I never got a good answer, so if there's a physicist watching this video who can give me information on it, please email me. And that is, in one of the books by Fry, F-R-Y, he said that, in fact, for a very high-pitched sound, there's more energy there because it takes more energy to produce more vibrations per second. So, you're producing many more vibrations per second than, uh, you don't have as many vibrations. So, with the same different frequencies, if other things are the same, 其他的因素都一样, according to Fry, you've got more energy with a high frequency pitch because it's going faster. It produces more energy. Because I've heard the saying that um, someone say, said that German, because they have more consonants that sound more backward, so they are less audi auditable. Audible. Audible. Oh, which kind, which kind of consonants are you thinking of, like <sighs> and <sighs> Well, they're, back or, they're, they're further back in the vocal tract. If it's something right at the front, shh, it's right towards the outside, and then it is more audible in that way. So with <sighs> But I just feel strange, because it means that German is um, German has a lot of shh sounds, too. Oh, it doesn't make me feel strange. Okay, be careful. Don't say that in English. It makes me feel strange. That's, that's Taiwan English. I need to point that out to you because it's so common. Don't say. That makes me feel strange. Okay. So, this, I think this is really odd. When I hear this, I find it very odd. Johaba. Mm -hmm. No, it doesn't overall. It certainly balances itself out because German has plenty of things in front. So they have p and t close to the front and lots of shh and things like that. So it balances out. You can make them louder. It's just inherently tape menzula because it's not towards the front of the vocal tract where it's hitting the air. Like pa and ka. Pa, it's, it's so close. The release of the stop is outside, in the outside air. So it's going to be pretty loud. And then your microphone often will pop. But you can also make ka very loud if you want to. It's just going to be a little more limited because it's inside the vocal tract. That's all. So it doesn't mean that if you use the whole vocal tract, it will be louder. Not necessarily, no. It just means it's going to show you the form and structure of the whole vocal tract rather than just more on the front. There will, there will be some resonances probably of the whole vocal tract because it's making other parts of the vocal tract uh, resonate as well. Energy that's the best explanation I can give. That sound like it makes sense? Okay. Good question. Thank you. Anybody else? Anything else? Okay. Um, so what are you going to read for next week? What's the next chapter? <laughs> Think about that for a while. Okay, acoustic components of speech, and we're going to be catching up in the textbook now. Chapter 7 for next Wednesday. What is all this about? Because it's too difficult. Oh, but you'll catch up. And this will help. That's one really nice thing about using both books at a second semester. Even though there is new material, and even though it's challenging because we've got acoust acoustics now, it's physics, but you hear it more than once. Doesn't that help? The first time, the second time, the third time, maybe it kind of scares you and you still don't have it straight. But when you hear it repeated over and over again, along with demonstrations, you get more and more comfortable with it. And I'm not going to ask you to do a lot of fancy math or anything like that. You need to understand how it works, how we produce vowels and other sounds in the vocal tract. The, f the basic physics of it is enough. You want to ask something? Hi, I'm just sure. Okay. We learn a lot of vowels and consonants in the uh, textbook, right. and 
I couldn't mem uh, remember memorize them all, but when I reveal the word. Yeah, I could see that in the notes of a lot of you. A lot of you made a table of sounds that we've already taken a test on. It looked like it was a good review and now you're sorting them out in your head and remembering them better. Is that right? So that's part of the plan. It's because I think it's worked relatively well. We've kept it this way for over 10 years. And all the students, I can't remember anybody who had bad comments on this book. They found that it was not that difficult. It really reinforced what we were already learning. And sometimes it was actually rather humorous. It was fun. OK, so I'm, I'm convinced of the value of this. And then everybody felt really good when they finished a whole book at the end of the semester. We will not finish this whole thing together in class. You'll have to do chapter 11 yourself, like I said. And we will rush through 10, I can warn you. Eight is the toughest one. But as you know, although it's new and it's math and physics, it's not really that bad. Take it step by step. You can all handle it. Anything else? OK, so that's set. Very quickly, book sharing. I just put in, or I just received an order from Amazon. I try not to buy too many books because I have no more room in my house. This one I've been sort of tending this list for about a year. You know that Amazon has a has a cart, you can put things in your cart and then you can take them out and put something else in. I've been doing that with the same order for about one year. Mm -hmm. I finally decided it was time, so I finally ordered it and I did it through a forwarding service because Amazon does not ship secondhand books to Taiwan. You know that, right? Oh, you guys don't buy from Amazon. Well, that's okay. I'm not, I'm not trying to do a guang gao. <coughs> I became an early fan of Amazon because in my early years in Taiwan, I simply could not get books easily. It was really difficult to get a lot of books. You could order them through local bookstores. What I sometimes did is had my sister get it for me and then I'd get it when I went to the States or I'd put an order in at the University of Minnesota. It was just not convenient. The first time I got a box from Amazon, I was so thrilled because now I could get what I wanted but only new books. They have a whole mainland site. They have a, a Chinese language site for Chinese for, for mainland China for Amazon books. But I'm just telling you for your information, not as advertising. If you want to get a secondhand book from Amazon, you go to a forwarder. They will take off the packaging, put everything in one big box, and then mail it to you for a charge. This is the first time I used it, and it worked fine. Because I had some things that were not books. Books are not So if you get it through them, you may pay a little extra going through Haiguan, but it was really worth it for me because secondhand books are often much, much, much cheaper. Like a new book might be $50. You maybe get a secondhand copy for $6. Sometimes. I'm just telling you that because you need to get books and this is useful information. And this really was a huge, huge, wonderful thing when it finally worked out. So this is a book that I got in this shipment I've been working on for a year. And I have only started reading it. You'll see where my bookmark is. I'm still in chapter one. Yeah, I think I'm in chapter two now. I just finished one. It's written by a voice trainer. His name is Dudley Knight. He's quite well known in the States, at least among people who do voice and acting. And he started a list called Vastavox. You know, like the linguist list I told you about for people who like linguistics? You really should be on the linguist list. Well, if you do voice work, acting, and accents, because sometimes you need to speak like you have a Scottish accent or an Indian accent. There are people who train people to learn these accents for the stage or for movies. And a bunch of those are my friend on Facebook if you want to meet some of them. And Dudley Knight is one of the people who really did a lot, has done a lot for the whole field of voice training and accent training and so forth. He started a list in a website called Vastavox. You can find it on the internet with lots of resources for voice training and learning accents. 
and taking care of your voice, anything related to using your voice. And that's where I met a number of my Facebook friends, a lot of really good friends, really interesting friends. And people kept telling him, you really should write a book. He's given workshops over the years. He was at the University of California at Irvine. He's now retired. But over the years, he's given many, many workshops for actors in voice training. And they said, you really should write a book because your workshops are really wonderful. So he finally did it. And it only came out in September last year. It comes with a DVD. It shows you how this stuff works. And some people who do this stuff, they can use their ear and tell you it's right or it's not right. But you can see just from his illustrations that he knows what he's doing and he's very technical. So you will get a lot of heavy information, a lot of information that's not in our textbooks. And just by reading the first chapter, I was inspired. I go, yes, here's a person who's really sensitive about how listening and how speaking and how sound work. His first sound, uh, chapter is called Silence. He said, until you know silence, you are not ready to work with sound. You have to start from complete silence. He tells the story of somebody who was in the Sahara Desert, and they drove into a dune, and drove into well, was the space between between two dunes in a desert, right, where there's almost no life. He said that was the first time he felt absolute silence. Complete silence, no, no people fumbling around with bags, you know, no air conditioning, no bugs or birds, no power mowers, no uh, shuffling of feet or people breathing or anything. It was complete silence. So his first chapter was just about starting from complete silence. And just that alone inspired me. I thought, what a great book. And I decided I better share it with you. <laughs> OK, so this is Dudley Knight speaking with skill in introduction to Knight Thompson's speech work. He has his own system for training actors in voice. OK, that's that. And that one I got new. It's too new to have any secondhand books available. Or even if they're available, they're not cheap. OK, and this one was not that expensive. It was about 26 US dollars. 26美金还好, For that value, it's very good. The rest of this class today, oh, no, I have a few things I want to mention. One more thing is some of you still didn't write the, the phrase stop at stops correctly. Some of you wrote stop and stop. Two mistakes. Should be stop at a T. Now, how stop, how many S? Stop at stops. Many of my classes make this mistake. I take it for granted. I don't mention a lot of things because I think they're understood by everybody, but sometimes they're not. When I see your notes, I find some misunderstanding, so that's one. I want to mention just one other thing that's not directly related to phonetics, and that is that I find a lot of the problems in learning, I think I've told you about our discussion on Taiwan students being shy Right? And that there are very, there are a number of aspects of Taiwan and Chinese culture that are actually obstacles to learning. Didn't we talk about that or not? No? Okay. Well, actually, I gave a talk on this at the Multilingual Language Club. I'm the faculty advisor, and we had a panel discussion on it. And there are a number of things, of things in Taiwan and in general in, in Chinese culture that are actually obstacles to learning. And one of them is, are Taiwan students really, really dong about asking questions? No, that's number one. Why? Shy? Why are you shy? Number one, that's the biggest one, isn't it? You're afraid of making a mistake or asking what somebody thinks is a stupid question. Everyone's really afraid of that, and then you lose face. So you'd rather just shut up because that's safer. Is that right? Do you realize what a big obstacle that is to learning? Because you're not getting feedback. That means you will keep a wrong idea for a long time. It never gets corrected because you never ask. And the teacher can't give you feedback. This is not the right class to be scolding. I'm not scolding you because this class is one of the best classes I have as regards asking questions. Almost all of you will ask questions when you have questions. So that's one reason maybe why I assumed it was OK in my other classes, but in Dai Yingwen. Did everybody understand? <laughs> That's how they respond. I say it again. 
可以吗？都懂吗 ？I tried in Chinese. Maybe they didn't get my English. <laughs> time after time, it's already almost. We're getting to the end of the year, second semester, and they still do that. And we've talked about it explicitly, and they still don't do that. And another example happened today, and I'm putting it here just because a lot of the problems in learning, for example, in English. There's some really basic things about English that you've learned in this class and other classes that you think don't you think everybody should know? Like where to stop, how to phrase, right? Nani duan chu. Isn't that something every English learner should know? Do you agree? Right? We shouldn't run a race through a sentence. We should know where to pause. We should learn about the continuation rise. We should learn to stop at stops. We should learn the difference between un and ung. All of those things. Everybody should learn those things, right? Are you sure? <laughs> you have to give me feedback, or I don't trust you. And since I was a taha with us, so I realize it's on video. But don't you think those are important things for everybody to learn to learn English well? Any hesitation? Okay. Those are language problems. But in fact, a lot of the problems are not language problems. It's because people don't speak up or react or interact. So the teacher has a little too much authority. The students have a little too much fear. There's not enough interaction, so the students never find out what's wrong because the teacher hardly ever hears them. And one thing happened today that was also not related to language. It was something else. A lot of people were late to class today. It was an 8:10 class. Body and shifen. Now a lot of you sympathize, right? Because it's hard to get to an 8:10 class. But I think about I don't know eight people were late. A lot of people were late. And finally, another one came in, and I said, "I'll use Mary. Um, Mary, why are you late today?" She went like this. I said, "I'm not scolding you. I'm not yelling at you. I'm not punishing you. I just want to know the reason. Why are you late today? <laughs> Did you oversleep? Were you up during the night? Did your alarm clock not work? Did you get stuck in traffic? I just am curious why you are late today." And I kept pressing her. I said, "Well, did you just get up too late?" And she went, I said, I'm not going to yell at you. I'm just asking you a simple question. <laughs> I'm not your mother. I have no right to play that role, and I don't want to. I'm not going to yell at anybody. Have I ever yelled at anybody? I don't even do it to my own kids anymore. My kids are grown. Okay, I don't have the right to yell at anybody. Okay, all right. So I did not want to yell at her. I just was curious. What is it that makes people late for class? And the whole time she simply wouldn't answer, and I said, "You know, Mary, please tell me." And then we had to have a whole class discussion because she still wouldn't answer. <laughs> we took up almost the whole hour discussing. I said, "What are you going to do in the real world? Are some of us going to be late to work sometimes? Probably. We probably will be late to work sometimes, right? So, what are you going to do when your boss says, 'Amy, what happened? Are you going to go like this?'" What are you gonna do? And then? Right. Stop. That's enough. Tell them the reason. Apologize. We're done. The whole thing takes thirty seconds. <laughs> so I'm sorry. I overslept and I moved too slow. And I'm very sorry. I won't do it again. Good enough. I don't believe the second part. Just sorry is enough. <laughs> second part is I just don't believe it. Don't tell a lie. So. I just got up too late. I moved too slow. I'm sorry. That would have been the end. Not all of this. See, this is just an example. I'm putting it in here because in this class and the other classes that I teach, I keep thinking I'm going to find better ways to make things easier to understand, easier to learn, so that students can learn on their own, motivated by themselves. Like the Echo Method is a way of making you independent in your learning. You don't have to have a teacher constantly. Hanging over you, giving you feedback, because with the echo method, your ears get sharp enough that your ears are your teacher. Do you see what I mean? That's an example of what I mean by. I keep trying to think of ways that can make the students more independent, more powerful, so they need the teacher less and they depend on themselves more. Raise their motivation, raise their ability to 自我检查 their motivation to learn new things on their own, etc. All that stuff. And so a lot of my. Ideas have concentrated on the language itself. For example, do this, and your ah won't sound or won't your ah、eh、won't sound like ah. For example, that, that, right? That's a language problem. 
But in fact, a lot of the problems are not language problems. They're, when I ask you a question, you look down. Everybody see my point? So in fact, a lot of questions, even though we're teaching one specific subject, could be math, could be economics, could be biology, whatever it is, we keep trying to approach the problem by making the subject easier. But often it's not the subject, it's the culture and your habits and your attitudes that are getting in the way of learning. So before we start talking about stop at stops or about formants or anything like that, we first have to address how you answer a question, right? I'll give you another example. We're acting out skits from a TV series and I assign parts. This character is played by so-and-so. All the way through the list, we've done that before. Right, and it is the Gilmore Girls, in fact. We're moving on to Seinfeld soon. And I read through the list, and suddenly one student said, excuse me, Ms. Chung, I heard my name read twice. I said, yes, because the number of students doesn't come out right. A few of you will have to perform twice. And everybody panicked immediately. <laughs> Can you tell me why? No, that wasn't it. No, it wasn't that either. Yes, exactly. You got it, Annie. And what's the reason? Because uh, at first, I think they will hear their name only once. So after like, they hear their name once, they didn't pay attention. Absolutely. You got the whole thing. That's exactly what happened. And as soon as one person asked me this, and I said, you're going to perform twice, <gasps> the whole class went like this. And they said, excuse me, Ms. Chong. Do I have to perform twice? And then somebody else, excuse me, I said, what's wrong? I have the same question. <laughs> then I said, do I have to read through the whole list again? Yes. <laughs> and they said, yes. I said, OK, now this time, everybody listen from the beginning all the way to the end, even after you hear your name. And they did, because this time they were scared. <laughs> then I finished it. I said, is everything clear now? Everybody knows what you're performing? And they said, yes. I said. Should it have been necessary to read the list twice? Nobody hesitated. They said no. All right, those are two examples. Are those two examples? Did you count? Those are just two examples of things in the culture. Of I've heard my name, I can stop paying attention. Now this isn't just Chinese and Taiwanese people who do this, that selective attention. When I think it's important, I'll pay attention, and otherwise I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk about the things, whatever. This is not a, such a problem in a class like this, because by second semester, is it going to bring you any advantage to sneak a look at your, at your mail on your phone? When you're going to have tests to prepare for and stuff? In this class, everybody has to pay attention. Or you just, nobody would stay in this class if they had that kind of a xue xi tai du. But I see this over and over again. They only pay attention for a very brief period of time that they think they have to. And then they dream. And then they don't look things up on Google and they have to, for example, a third example, they performed, they performed their parts, but I could tell they didn't understand what they were saying. I said, if anybody has questions, what should you do? They said, ask. They said, but you weren't there, it was out of class. I said, well, what, the, what should you do then? Number one is Google, number two is email, number three is Facebook. All of those places, right? Nobody did it. Make sure you check everything and ask me what you don't understand. And there were still things that they didn't understand. All right, there's example number three. Get up on the stage. They performed the words without understand what they were, understanding what they were saying. And in a foreign language, if you don't understand what you're saying, is the, is the intonation going to be convincing? It can't be because you don't know what you're saying. So do you see point number three? about problems that are not directly related to language, that are, that are obstacles to learning? Do you know what I'm talking about, Umi? Umi? I didn't get the last one. The last one? Because they were willing to just get the assignment, memorize the parts, and not look up the things they didn't know. Or if they couldn't find it in the dictionary, they just gave up. And then when they performed it, they didn't understand what they were saying fully. So is that going to be convincing? Will they do a good job on intonation then? No, they can't because... So you don't know what to get excited about and what to be embarrassed about and what to cry about? You don't know because you don't understand it properly. I could see that in their performances. 
And for example, there was the word Amish. Amish, Mio Jiangguo Maha. Amish is it's a religious group. They came over to America from mainly northern Germany. They were Mennonites. It's a particular sect of Christianity. And they stayed among themselves in their own community. They dress in black and white. They do not embrace modern te technology, so no cars and no, no computers. No electricity. no electricity in most cases. They're different. Different people have different stages or different levels of what they will accept. But the really strict ones will not even allow pockets in your clothes. Then, some of them, stricter ones. What's the point? Well, to each his own. If we see too many people like us, we forget that there are many ways to live in this world. It doesn't have to be our way with a cell phone. It doesn't have to be that way. So I'm just saying that there was a mention of Amish, and they were talking about school uniforms and starting at a new school with uniforms. And the main character said, well, I'm happy to have uniforms. It shows people want to study hard, and they're not always comparing designer jeans. And then her friend said, well, reading, liking to read is one thing, but then there's Amish. There's liking to read, then there's Amish. Now, out of context, most Taiwanese would not understand there's Amish. But what did Amish refer to here? They're talking about school uniforms. Because she was at a public school where there are no uniforms. She's going to an expensive private school where they have to wear uniforms. And she's saying, I'm happy to wear the uniform because it shows people want to study and they're not just comparing designer jeans. Her friend said, well, liking, there's liking to read and then there's Amish. Can you understand what she's trying to say? Dull, right. Too dull, too plain. I can show this is a good thing. 可是塑到像阿美什那种程度太过分了，因为那个制服很素，很不好看。Now do you understand? Well, there's liking to read, then there's Amish. So she's saying it's good they like to read, but I don't really like uniforms that much. I'm not really in favor of uniforms. So nobody understood Amish. Nobody had ever heard of the Amish. I got out some pictures from Google. And it showed them in their carts, their buggies, their horse-drawn buggies, in their black and white clothes. The women wear bonnets. You've read about bonnets in Jane Austen, maybe? We haven't worn them for a few hundred years. <laughs> right, they, the women still wear bonnets. And I showed them. Those are bonnets. Okay, those are bonnets. And I showed them some pictures from, from Google Images. And someone in the middle said, oh, <laughs> Now this was something, what should they have done before they performed something that mentioned the Amish? What should they have done? Jerome? Because uh, when, uh, that's for me, whenever I see a new word that I don't understand, I will uh, look, look that up in the dictionary and then Google it. That's right. So you would have checked it. And then you probably would have looked at the images in this case. Because once you look at the images, you may think, well, this is from 100 or 200 years ago. But it's today. And that student said, Shenda hai yo ah. His mouth hung open. Now, he should have done that when? Before they performed it. All right, there was another example. Do you see, have you collected the examples I've been giving you? None of these are language problems. Habit, attitude. Cultural. So that's why we had this, this panel discussion not long ago on cultural aspects. Or let's say that about, about aspects of Taiwan, Taiwanese and Chinese culture that get in the way of learning. It's less of an issue with you but all of you know exactly what I'm talking about because sometimes you kind of hide in class too, right? And would rather be quiet than ask a question. We've taken a whole hour of class when we need to be rushing in the textbook. But this is so important now that I considered it worthwhile because you know the articles I've been writing for Shi De, and you consider them useful, right? Mm -hmm. I wanted for the next year, because I'm almost finished with the first two years of these articles. Mm -hmm. For the third year, I was going to write on grammar. Tommy Jean Kaisa promote grammar. But after today, what do you think I'm thinking about writing now? 
Because what good is any of this going to do if you've got all these other obstacles that stop you before you even get to the point where you're supposed to be learning language? And also we talk about jiao gai, and they talk about changing textbooks. I know everybody shakes their head when we mention that word. But is this something that teachers have to wait for a directive from the MOE before they do anything different? If we want to make changes in this area, do we have to wait until the Ministry of Education gives us a new plan and new orders about how to teach? Do we have to wait for that? No. What could we do? Taken just as a person who's concerned about this question, what would be your approach to do something different? I mean, I think all of you must be convinced of the value of asking questions and getting feedback. All of you can now accept corrections. Maybe when I first started correcting your English, you felt a little, a little insulted or a little. <laughs> At the beginning, it didn't feel very good. Is that right? Especially if I kept picking on it. No, no, no. It's like, once more, once more. <laughs> but I think it now, maybe you don't love it, but I think you understand the value of it. And you know that a lot of you have improved amazingly because you've gotten e information, you've gotten feedback, and you now know how to use that feedback to improve yourself. So you know that nobody is trying to insult you or make you feel bad. It's part of learning because there's not going to be learning without mistakes. So based now on where you are in your own Licheng of learning and becoming an adult, how would you address this problem? Like I said, this isn't really something for which we have to wait for a directive from the Ministry of Education and then suddenly we tell all the teachers they have to do it this way. We don't have to wait for the Jiao Yibu on this one at all. But what could we do? Because obviously you see how much this is getting in the way of learning. When I look at my students' mistakes, I just had to mark some written work for Dai Ying Wen. The S's were missing, the E's were missing, the tenses were all wrong, the he's and she's were mixed up, the us and the thes and the kushu bu kushu ita hu tu. So in the past, I've always been approaching it from a language angle. But there's something else going on, right? So tell me, what would you do in this situation? Like I said, we're not going to wait for something from the Jiao Yibu. I don't think they're thinking about this anyway. We don't have to wait for anybody from the government. But what could and should we do? It's break time. I want you to think deeply about this. Put this down in your notes. Notes for next Monday, please. Think deeply about it. <coughs> because this Taiwan health and xingsheng, it depends on this. Competitiveness. Taiwan is much less competitive than it could be because of a lot of these reasons. And I'll tell you one more interesting thing. I've told you that recently I've been talking to somebody in Africa from Zimbabwe. And I became friends with him because he plays the imbira, the thumb piano, which is an instrument I learned a little bit of, and I got to talking to him and we have a lot of the same ideas about education. When I was telling him about these things with my students, he wrote back and he said, ha ha ha, are you writing about Zimbabwe or Taiwan? <laughs> which tells you it's not universal. In America, it's not quite like this. OK, we Mao the Westerners. But in many countries that are used to a very authoritarian kind of educational system and social structure, it's the same. So we found that many of the things that are true of Taiwan are also true of Zimbabwe. Now, do you feel a little weird being compared to an African country? Not that you should be prejudiced against them, but you find that there are similar problems holding back both countries in the same ways. We're always comparing ourselves to Ome, right? And we think that we're actually, we're actually honorary Americans here. Don't you sometimes feel that because Taiwan is wealthy and pretty well educated, good standard of living? So actually you're more like America than a lot of countries are. But in this way you're more like Zimbabwe. And Zimbabwe is actually a really nice country, I should, I should add. We probably don't know enough about Africa, so don't feel insulted by it. They have a lot of really, really wonderful things. Music is one of them. 
they have the same problems, exactly the same things. Now maybe that hits you a little harder, I hope. You may did. Tongji. Right? What was your reaction? Sure. Uh, it, it just made me I just find it hard to be compared with uh, to be compared to Zimbabwe because um, most of us think that uh, we are we are like European countries or yeah. America. Yeah. But and we look down at American countries. We think that they're poor and they have a corrupt government and blah blah blah. Well, we have enough corruption here if you've been listening to this. Today morning, the news is talking about this. Someone wants to do seven years. Do seven years. All right. Corruption is everywhere. America, the American con Congress, is deeply corrupt. Is deeply corrupt. All right. You have to know that. So nobody is immune from corruption. But suddenly being compared to Zimbabwe, you will find that there are many nice things about Zimbabwe that you were probably dismissing, you didn't know about, you didn't know how wonderful they were. A lot of, for example, a lot of African cultures are very people-centered, like Chinese traditionally are very people and family-centered. Many African cultures are too. And they've also got this authority structure, which is similar to here, which is why they have similar problems sometimes. Okay, so we've taken an hour on this, but when I do this, it's always because it's yujongxinxinchang, it's something I feel strong about, strongly about. A lot of the things that we're trying to attack, we're attacking with the wrong tools. We're, we're using language tools, but we're going to have to use some other cultural tools, human tools, other things, not just language. The problem is not just language. Okay? Think about that. I want all of you to write on this for your notes, in your notes for Monday. Okay? Serious assignment, you really need to do this. Think about it deeply. Okay? Don't just, don't just, um, Write any old thing. Just scribble any old thing. Think about it deeply and write about it. We need a break. Okay, so second hour, we're going to our textbook. Just a very few things. I'm writing an article now about Wade Giles' romanization. Remember that we learned pinyin last semester, and some of you learned it also in freshman English. And I have to write for a future publication, future book for Routledge, a piece on Wade Giles' romanization. And that led me to this book by Zhou Yu Guang. And he has written a lot, especially about writing in China and world writing systems. And I didn't get the, the particular book that I wanted. I, thought, I think it was called Han Zi Shen Li Lun. I couldn't find that one, but I found this one in the library. So you should know about Zhou Youguang. He's a very famous, very outstanding linguist. And the next thing was. I just wanted to continue a little bit more on my Zimbabwean friend. We got to talking first because I like the Mbira, I like Mbira music. And then we found out that we had similar, we had a lot of similar ideas on education. And my personal Lisha is to make the world a better place through better English. If you speak better, better pronunciation, better grammar, better everything, the better your English sounds, the more opportunities will come to, the more competitive you'll be. You just have a lot more power if your English is good and if you learn how to learn well. And my Zimbabwean friend has the same idea about Mbira. He wants to make the world a better place through Mbira because it's a traditional instrument of Zimbabwe. And just like many countries, which, what do you think people study here more? Is it Western music or Chinese music? Of course, Western, right? Chinese music is hardly covered at all in school. You may get a little bit about the instruments. How much did you learn about Chinese music in school? A there tiny? Was, like, there was only like five pages on Chinese instruments in high school. There you go. And so a lot of you are not really that familiar with Chinese instruments or Chinese music, right? Is that right? How do you answer this question? You're not that familiar with Chinese music and instruments, is that right? Yes, that's right. You can say, yes, that's right. You can say, no, we're not, or yes, that's right. Write that down, because this is going to confuse you, and you have to make it clear to the listener, because it's a confusing part of English, even for native speakers sometimes. So let's try it again. So a lot of you don't know that much about Chinese musics, uh, music or musical instruments. Is that right? Yes, that's right. Or? No, we don't. No, we don't. OK. So in Zimbabwe, it's the same thing. Um, Violin and Western instruments like it are the prestigious instruments. But they have 
they have a they have a culture of music that's thousands of years old, 几千年 the Imbira culture, 这是母子情的文化，有几千年 It's very deep. It's very spiritual. It's very beautiful. When Europeans discovered it in the 19th century, they said, "This is as good as Western music." Thumb piano. Yeah. It has strips of metal on a board,、oh, yeah. and then you play it like this.、Oh, okay, I could show you a video, but we we've already taken a lot of time on this. I'm just talking about it because it ends up that in addition to both of us liking this particular kind of music, I took a camp in Imbira Plain in Berkeley years ago, so I knew something about it, and that's how I met this person on Facebook. In addition to Both of us liking Imbira, and he's an Imbira teacher. He's running an Imbira center in Zimbabwe, in Harare, in the capital. We found that we had the same idea of trying to make the world a better place through. For him, it's for for spreading Imbira, for getting Zimbabweans interest more interested in their own tradition. It's not dead yet, but it was suppressed for a long time, and especially since it's a former colony, former British colony, and Western things were considered more prestigious. It's the same thing that happened here. There are so many similarities. You know, if you're irritated being compared to Zimbabwe, you're going to find more and more things to be irritated at, because there are so many similarities. And that's one reason we got to talking so much because of the sim similarities. He wants to make people、uh, more aware of these cultures, learn how to play it, appreciate the music. It feels good because it's your own culture. You feel proud of it. You feel very grounded and rooted in your own culture, instead of just learning something from another culture. Because everybody else does it in the world,、um, I feel similar things. I mean, for a lot of Chinese things, actually, my my field is not English; it's Chinese. I majored in Chinese. I love Chinese, so I feel the same way. In addition to improving people's language ability in English, I think more needs to be done in Chinese as well. I think Chinese education is also quite neglected here, because a lot of the times, the things that you read in Chinese literature class are really boring. But Chinese literature is not boring. And when I mention Hong Long Mong, my student goes, "Ah, how will you?" If you say that, you have not read Hong Long Mong. It's just the most amazing book, right? So we have very similar feelings about finding the things at your root, you know, that are part of your roots, and learning them well and appreciating them, and then you can really develop solidly, not just copying other people, trying to be Westerners, thinking you're Western, but actually you're more like Zimbabwe. Do you see what I'm saying? Okay, so anyway, we had a lot of similar ideas on that, and that's why we're talking. And then Sylvie just asked, and and also Carol, what exactly is the assignment? Okay, the way I can state it, the way I can focus it is, first of all, I want you to think about what are the obstacles to learning that are inherent in Chinese and Taiwanese culture. I'm just going to say Chinese, because this is a Han people's culture, not just Taiwan. What are the obstacles to learning that are inherent? In Chinese and Taiwanese culture, that's part one. In part two, how could we address these issues? How could we improve education for the coming generations? With these in mind, we know that these are obstacles. What could we do? At what level? How? I mean, pretend that you have endless resources and that you have a lot of people who agree with you. What would you do if you could? If you had the resources, we just need ideas now. How could we improve things for the coming generations so that they will be less held back by these obstacles that are inherent in Chinese culture? Did that make it clear? Okay. Now we had a whole panel discussion on it with the Duo Guo Yuan Hui Hua She, and there were some really good things that came out of it. But there's a lot more to be said, and we're going to discuss it in Yingting as well. So I've brought it now to this class as well. Right. What does it have to do with phonetics? Okay. Well, I tried to say it just a minute ago. I'm constantly trying to get you to speak perfectly, right? I'm trying to get you to speak perfectly. But a lot of times, the problem is not a language problem. There's something else going on. For example, people are shy, or we have not developed listening skills. This has a lot to do with phonetics and with all language learning, because. The reason I did phonetics, the reason I took this class in the first place, is because it's they wanted to have a class required for the Jiao Yu Xue Chang to make sure that the teachers that Tai Da graduates that are going to teach English will not teach their children, their students, really bad English habits. 
with bad pronunciation. That was the, that was the origin of this class. But you see, a lot of the problem is not a language problem. It's because it's a learning and attitude and culture problem. So that's how it relates. Does that relate it clearly to what we're doing or not? Yeah. So I should, I should think about this in more about phonetics. You can think about it in terms of phonetics, because the nigga is tai gala. We have to start deeper at the at the root. You think of it in terms of language learning. Because language learning, a lot of you are some of you anyway will probably be English teachers in the future. So and this is this is a course that belongs to the Jiao Yu Shui Cheng, so it definitely relates directly to that. So that you still think about the roots about the The roots of the problem and then if you need a direction, put it in language learning. Language learning. Okay? Does that Rationalize it enough for you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah, because a lot of there, there's serious, serious problems in English learning here. I mean, when I saw the problems in my students' writing, and it was these are the best students we've got in Taiwan, because they went to you and they don't seem to care that much. There's something really serious happening. So no matter what we do in language, if we're taking a language approach, it's not gonna. It's not going to produce good English speakers if we don't address the other problems first. That's what I'm trying to say. Annie gets what I'm saying, right? Good. <laughs> Anybody else? You didn't you All right. Okay, ma. So I would like that in your notes for Monday. I want you to think about that. Go down to the roots. How can we teach our children better in the future? Help them learn better on their own. It's not just us teaching. It's going to be them learning on their own. Give them more tools. Empower them. Give them good attitudes for learning and so forth and so on. We're on page 190. Yeah? Can, can, can I write about how to teach characters? You can write anything that inspires you. It, it sounds like that inspires you because of your Jia experience. Uh, oh, no. Not exactly. It's on my, my, um, my current school, my future in current school when I, have, when I was in uh, junior. Junior high school, and he met a lot of parents that we called Zhizhen Jifu. Mm -hmm. Helicopter parents. Yeah. Yeah. And he come from many problems, and I also have oh, my, my students are very good. It's okay. My students are very good, but they're not good. So it um, yeah, inspired me a lot. I think sometimes the problem is. Um, Right, exactly. And that's part of the culture. So yes, that's very relevant. Anything that inspires you. I mean, don't feel forced to stick to one agenda. Something that inspires you is much more useful. Okay? Yes, please in English. <laughs> If, you, if it ends up that you're going to write only a very short paragraph in English, but you could write a page or two in Chinese, if you add something in Chinese, that's fine with me too, but in English would be best. Okay? Usually on something like this, I allow my students to write Chinese so they can say everything they have to say. Anybody else have any questions or comments? Yeah, helicopter parents. Parents are really protective. And children now, they expect a lot. They expect not to put out so much, and they want lots of money for doing it. And it's really true. A lot of employers won't even take Taida students because of this attitude. We're on page 192 models. And who is our reader? Vivian, I remember, yeah. Okay, let's go. Um, two models. The formants that characterize different vowels are the result of the different shapes of the vocal tract. Uh, any body of air? Any? Any? Any body of mm -mm. air? Mm -mm. That was on the pronunciation test. Oh. <laughs> oh. Any body mm -hmm. of air, mm -hmm. such as that in the vocal tract. Such as that in the vocal tract. Slow down a bit. <laughs> such as that in the vocal. You're going too fast. <laughs> such as that, pause, which is. So this is sun rea, which is. Such as that, which is. And when we have sun rea, then we usually have a pause. So slow down a bit such as that in the vocal tract or that in the bottle. 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 <laughs> same as body. It's the same. Bottle will 
vibrate in a way that depends on its size and shape. Size and shape. Size and shape. Not size and shape. Size and shape. Roll over it. Size and shape. Mm -hmm. Okay, 不要太急 Size and shape. Size and shape. Okay, remember it's not size; it's size because it's voiced at the end. Size and shape. Uh, size and shape. Mm -hmm. uh, if you blow across the top of an empty bottle. Bottle. Bo mm -hmm. <laughs> bottle. You're doing fine. Bottle. You can produce a low-pitched note.、Uh, if you partially fill the bottle with water so that the volume of air is smaller, you will be able to produce a note with a higher pitch.、Uh, smaller, smaller, smaller,、mm -hmm. smaller bodies of air are similar to small, smaller piano strings. Piano strings. Piano strings.、Mm -hmm. Or smaller organ pipes, in that they produce higher pitches. In the case of vowel sounds, the vocal tract vowel sounds、uh, vowel sounds. But your stress was good. <laughs> the vocal tract has a complex complex shape. Com complex、mm -hmm. has a complex shape, so that the different bodies of air、mm -hmm. produce a number of overtones. Beautiful. Your reading is really nice. You need to slow down sometimes. You kind of rush through things. Characterize sounds like dongbu, and I, I really wanted to change it because I say characterize, but when I hear it, it's not wrong. It's perfectly good <laughs> East Coast English, and that's why I learned Lenzhu. I mean, I keep thinking you must be from New York, but that's quite a compliment. <laughs> okay, I say characterize, but characterize is perfect for the East Coast.、Um, Yeah, you just need to slow slow down, put in more pauses. Remember the continuation rise, but your vowels and consonants are beautiful in most cases. This part I think we can understand easily because of what we've already covered. Is that right? Is everything completely clear? Is there anything that's not clear? Then we can keep going. Good. The air in the vocal tract is set in vibration by the action of the vocal folds. Every time the vocal folds open and close, there is a pulse of acoustic energy. These pauses act like sharp taps on the air in the vocal tract, setting the resonating cavities into vibration, so that they produce a number of different frequencies, just as if you were tapping on a number of different bottles at the same time. All right, let's just slow down. You read it beautifully and fluently, but can everybody absorb what's coming by? Let me just kind of 表演给你们看 and then we'll continue. We've got air coming from the lungs, going through the vocal folds. Every time they open and close, air is being pushed out. Pop, 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 pop. So the air is like making taps. It says here、uh, on the air in the vocal tract. So pop, pop, pop. it's tapping against the air that's already in your vocal tract. Tap, 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 because it's coming out in pulses. Although it's so fast that you can't see it moving, it'll just look like a blur. And these will set in the different cavities in your vocal tract into resonating vibrations. It will make them vibrate at their resonating frequency. Frequency. Okay. So we'll get different resonances. It's just as though you were tapping different <coughs> bottles. You have a vocal tract full of different size bottles, and the air is going tap, 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 producing different pitches that way. Okay. In respective of the rate of vibration of a vocal fold. The air in the vocal tract will resonate as. Slow, slow down, slow down. Add is a 接续词 so you should pause. The air in the vocal tract will resonate. You're、uh, you're going really fast. First of all, the air in the vocal tract is the end of the subject. So we what? Pause. Right. So vocal tract is the end of the subject. Pause a little bit. We'll resonate. Then we pause because before a preposition. Before a prepositional phrase, we need to pause. So, you you seem like your side pal. Your reading is really very nice. Pronunciation is good. You're very fluent, but you're not stopping enough. So, 我刚刚讲的有关短句的问题 You have to remember to pause. The air in the vocal tract will resonate. Resonate. This is a verb. Resonate.、Mm -hmm. At these frequencies, as long as as long as long. Long. Look at my mouth. Long. 
long. Yours is really short. Mine is long. Watch. Long. 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 Slow down. Long. Okay, do it as slow as I do. Do it with me. 同时, be watching me and listening. Go. Long. Again. Long. Once more. Long. There. Try it. As long mm -hmm. as the position of the... As the position. Watch your Z's. As the position of the vocal organs remains the same. Remains. Remains. Re make it longer. Remains. Nope. Listen to me do it. And then keep the echo. Remains the same. Remains the same. That's better. Okay, same. Not same. Same. Not same. Okay, this is an important point because the formants have nothing to do with the rate of vibration of the vocal folds. I mentioned that earlier. So, GP, F0, it doesn't matter if it's very fast or if it's very slow, if it's in the middle, all of the formants always stay the same. It has nothing to do with F0. F0 gives it the source energy that sets off the vocal cavities, the vocal tract cavities into vibration, but it will make them vibrate at their own frequencies. So, formants, one, two, three, have nothing to do with F0, totally independent. Just keep that in mind, okay? Because of, because of the complex shape of the tract, the air will vibrate in more than one way at once. It's as if the air in the back of a vocal tract slow down. might vibrate. Start with its and slow down. It's as if the air in the back... The air plus in is right? Try it again. It's as if the air in the back of the vocal tract might vibrate one way. One way? One way. Good. Produce, producing a low frequency waveform. Free, not frequency. Frequency. A low, a low freak, frequency waveform. That's form. good. Everyone, frequency. Frequency. A lot of you say frequency or say it all kinds of ways, but it's supposed to be frequency. 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 Try it. Frequency. Okay, again. Producing a low fre frequency mm -hmm. waveform while the air in front of the tongue, a, small, a smaller cavity. A might, smaller cavity? A smaller cavity mm -hmm. might vibrate in another way. In, uh, not in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in, 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 uh, right. in, right. in, in, uh, in, in, in another na, way. In another, another way. That's right. Producing a higher frequency waveform. A higher frequency waveform. A higher frequency waveform. Right? What's the day B? Lower. No, we don't have lower. It's low. And higher, and then frequency waveform is repeated. That's why we don't want to stress it. Okay? A third mode of vibration of the air in the vocal tract might produce a sound of even higher frequency. Of? Of, of even higher frequency. Frequency. Think. Somebody help. Wendy? Do the, we need the whole phrase. By itself, it doesn't mean anything. Remember that stress is always relative. It's always in comparison to something close by. That's right. Okay. Produce a sound of even higher frequency. That's right. Okay, say frequency again. Frequency. Now it's correct. It's good. What we actually hear in vowels. Slow down. What we actually hear in vowels. Look at look at my hand, kind of drawing out the rhythm. What we actually hear in vowels. You're going so fast that I'm just getting like this. So what we actually hear in vowels is the sum. But it should be what we actually hear in vowels is the sum of these waveforms. Added together, so it have the, it should have this rolling kind of intonation, and that da 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 da, dun da dun da dun. Okay. What we actually hear in vowels is the is the sound is, of is not is is. 
is the sum of these three forms added together. Good. Together. Together. T together. Right. We don't say together. We say together. Together. Okay. Overall, really good reading. But there's some places where you can, I think you can improve. You can, can And try to work on that rolling intonation. Using the echo method with an audio file or a, a video will definitely help. Um, it says here, the vocal tract has a complex shape, so the air is vibrating in different ways in different parts of the vocal tract. We know that. And the air in the back might vibrate one way, has a lower pitch. Like for an E, the air in the back, F1, is going to be quite low. But the air in the front is going to be very, very in a, vibrating in a very small space, which gives us a high pitch. So that'll have a higher frequency waveform. Then a third mode of vibration might produce a sound of an even higher frequency. And so we're going to hear these three sounds taken together, and that's what produces what we hear as vowels. We've been over that before, but just to make you feel more comfortable with it. F3, he didn't describe any particular space because we can't really tell you which space it is. We can only say it involves lip rounding. Okay? First two paragraphs, okay, let's go on. The relationship, ship, ship. Ship. Uh -huh. the relationship between uh, resonance, frequency, Resonant. resonance right. frequencies and vocal tract shape okay. is much more, is, is much more, <laughs> is actually much more complicated than the air in the back part of the vocal tract vibrating in one way and the air in other parts vibrating in, a, in another. In another. In another. Good. Here we will just concentrate on the, on the fact that in most, in most voiced sounds, three formants start produce Every time produced. the vo produced every time the vocal votes vibrate. Note that the resonance in the vocal track is independent of the rate of vibration of the vocal votes. Of the not of 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 the vocal votes. Okay, everybody. Resonance. It's not resonance. 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 Uh huh. O F of. 大家留意 is 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 not is is O F is of. And the resonance in the vocal tract is independent of the rate of vibration of the vocal folds. Okay, go on. The vocal folds may vibrate. Fold. It should be it should be s, isn't it? A, that's a typo. Found another one. Can we just have one vocal fold? Remember last semester? Yeah, it's possible to have one vocal fold. But how did it sound? Do you remember, Jack Klugman? Hey, ha! It sounded like this. Did you listen to it? But he was able to learn how to train himself to use that single vocal fold. Okay. The vocal folds may vibrate faster or slower, giving the sound a higher or lower pitch. But the formant frequencies. Formant frequencies. The formant frequencies. 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 C's. C's. Right, not C's. That's that's KK. Frequencies. Frequencies. Good. Will remain the same. As the long, same. The same. As same. Long, same. Uh -huh. Remain the same. Try, listen again. Listen to me do it. Remain the same. Remain the mm -mm. same. Ca capture the echo. Remain the same. Remain the Remain. Same. May, may, the may. May. Remain. Remain. No? Let's just do that word. Remain. Remain. You're, you're going too fast, and it's, the N is coming too soon. The N is very, very short. Make the A, A part really long. Remain. Remain. Not me at the beginning. It starts out with A and goes to E. A, E, A, E, I, O, U, A, E. Yeah. Remain. You're going too fast to the E. Nigga A and Ting Remain. 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 It's getting better. It's getting better. Okay. We'll remain mm -hmm. the same. 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 There we go. Now you got it. As long as. As long as. As long as. 
There are no cha chains. Mm-hmm. Okay. Chains is... She's not done. James She's not done. Give her some time. <laughs> uh-huh. There are no changes, changes mm? in the... No, no, no. You had the vowel right the first time. <laughs> Keep the vowel. Ch changes. Right? Changes. Changes. Changes is Z at the end, not S. Changes. There are no changes mm -hmm. in the shape of the vocal tract. All right. We got that. And he's really repeating what we said earlier. So it doesn't matter how fast or how slow the vocal folds, the vocal folds vibrate, the formants always stay the same. Unless you move something around, like your tongue, then that's going to change the formants. So it's your tongue and your other upper vocal tract organs that determine the formants. There is nothing particular new. Particular what? New. No. Particularly. Right. New. About this way of. This. Not these. This. this. Mm -hmm. About this way mm? of. About this. this way of. About this way of. Analyzing vowel sounds. Vowel sounds, yeah, good. The general theory of formants was stated by the great German Shh. scientist Hermann Helmholtz. Helmholtz. Helm, Helmholtz. Helm, L, yeah, huh? Helmholtz. Mm -hmm. Helmholtz. About 150 years ago. Not years, years. Years. Uh -huh. Okay. Even or even, earlier, in the end. even earlier mm -hmm. in 1829. Not 18. 18. 18. Uh -huh. 18. Uh -huh. The English physicist. Do the whole thing. The year. Even earlier mm -hmm. in 1829. Nine. Nine. There's another N there. Yeah, that's what I was missing. Okay, or what you were missing. The English physicist. 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 C is almost never Z. Almost never. Physicist. Physicist. Uh -huh. Robert Willis said. 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 Uh -huh. A given vowel is merely the rapid repetition of its particular huh? note. Uh -uh. Peculiar note. Uh -huh. We should. We would nowadays say that a vowel is the. Eh? Say that a vowel is the that, uh. that a vowel a vowel is a the rapid repetition. Uh, I didn't hear the d. Uh, rapid mm -hmm. repetition. 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 Good. Corresponding to the vibration of the vocal fold. To the what? Vibrations mm -hmm. of <laughs> the you. vocal fold. <laughs> yes. Of its peak. Peculiar two or three notes corresponding to its formant. All right, do you hear what they're saying here? A given vowel is merely the rapid repetition of its particular, peculiar, now I'm doing it, peculiar note, but it's not just one note, is it? We've really got four notes to think about. The first one is the fundamental frequency, F0. F0 is what we call the fundamental frequency, the GP. That's the first one. Then? Formants one, two, and three, right. <clears throat> and the, the F0 doesn't really matter. The F0 doesn't really matter, as long as there is voicing. It's good enough. We can, in fact, go even further and say, say that not only vowels, but all... But all but voice all sounds. Voice sounds. But all voice sounds. But all voice sounds. Voiced sounds. Voiced sounds. Good are distinguishable from one another by their form and frequencies. 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 Good. Let's practice that again. Frequencies. Frequencies. That's beautiful. We don't need to do it again. Now you've got it, but please remember it when you're reading. I think this is also pretty clear as well, right? Good. Let's keep going. Question? Is peculiar or peculiar? Peculiar. I use a schwa. Peculiar. Peculiar. The notion that vowels contain several different pitches at the same time at the, at the mm -hmm. same time Good. is difficult to appreciate. 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 Mm -hmm. One way of making one it way. one way of making it clearer is to build up a sentence from the component mm -hmm. waves. Mm -hmm. 
What's from stress? from the component right com component waves component component Good. waves. Yep. The peach synthesis. Oops. The speech synthesis demonstration on the CD shows how this how this can be done. I want you to stop there because I'm just going to explain here. All that we're going to do now is we're going to listen to this sentence. A bird in the hand is worth two in the bush, but I believe they use a British accent, so it would be a bird in the hand is worth two in the bush. A bird in the hand is worth two in the bush. Okay, that's the best I can do. But um, what are we going to do now? First of all, we're going to listen to it in a synthesized version of Peter Latifoged's voice. And the first link enables you to hear just the variations in the... Keep following in the book. First format. So we're going to isolate the first format and listen only to F1. We're only going to listen to F1. So everybody get ready for some weird sounds. And they don't have good intonation here because I think they used just a steady pitch for F0. So it will sound pretty mechanical when you hear it. But at least you can understand it okay, right? A bird in the hand is worth two in the bush. We don't like the F0, but it's perfectly clear, right? So we're, we're going to hear that sentence, but only with F1. Let's hear how it sounds. Could you understand it? Listen again. I'll turn up the volume. If you didn't know what the sentence was beforehand, would you have understood it? Probably not. That's F1. But if you think that's bad, wait until we isolate the other formats. Just listen one more time. Only F1. If we know what the sentence is, then we can still make sense of it, right? If you know what's coming, you can still understand it. Okay, so it says that it sounds like a muffled version of the sentence. Muffled means like if you put a wedeen in front of your mouth. Something like that. That's a muffled version. The vocal pulses have been produced at a steady rate so that the utterance is on a monotone. I already warned you about that. What you hear is the changes in pitch are the changes in the overtones of this monotone voice. So any pitch changes that you hear are not the F0 variations. It's not the F0 that is varying or that is um, changing. We don't have any particular intonation. It's just flat. So it's not the F0 that is causing the different pitches that we hear. It's all in the resonances of F1. Okay. Mm. These overtone pitch variations convey a great deal of the quality of the voice sounds, even though it's muffled and not clear and we don't like it. If we know what the sense is, we can still hear it clearly. Just one more time. Right? We don't like it, but it's still clear, if we know it's coming anyway it is. The rhythm of the sentence is apparent because the overtone pitches occur only when the vocal folds would have been vibrating. So, eating yao yo, voicing, woman tai wei ting dao yin. So, 整个那个音调我们还是听得出来, or the rhythm, 节奏, not 音调, 节奏. The amplitude of the first format is turned up only at these times, only when we have voicing. We can also see F1 in a spectrogram without voicing, but it would be very light. We only hear the volume turned up when there's voicing, okay? So you will still see the formants when there's no voicing, because they will still be excited. They will still be um, bitsuji, but we won't hear them very loud. Only when we have voicing, then we'll hear the formants clearly. The second link below the table on the CD does the same for the second formant. This time, the equivalent of a series of monotone vocal pulses has been used to excite only the second formant. Again, the variations of these overtone pitches convey much of the vowel quality. All right, let's listen to F2. Remember what F1 sounds like, and we're going to go to F2 now. We don't like that, do we? It sounds very electronic, doesn't it? it sounds sort of robot-y, like a computer might talk to you. It is a computer talking to you. It's exactly what it is. I'm right on the hand, and we're on the mush. Sort of like that. Very nasal sounding, and it's higher. F2 is higher, because the higher from F1, that's the lowest formant, then to F2, that's higher, and F3 is higher than those two. All right, listen again to F2 all by itself. We can still hear the vowel qualities though, right? Listen carefully. You know what's coming. You know, and with that assumption, I think you can follow which word is which very easily. 
It's very buzzy and electronic and nasal, but we can still hear the vowels okay, right? What do you think will happen with the third format? It says the variations of these overtone pitches convey much of the vowel quality when we listen to the second format all by itself. But the same is not so true of the third format by itself, which you can hear by playing the third link. This format adds to the overall quality of the sound, but in this sentence it does not play a very significant role. So now you're all ready for something that's going to be very unintelligible and not very pleasant, right? Well, let's find out what it sounds like. Now, can you recognize everything clearly in this? We can't. For F1 and F2, we didn't like the sound, but we could still hear the vowels clearly. We could follow easily. We can hamish on the follow, but we, it's, it's getting really tough now. That's F3. Okay? So now you've heard each format by itself. Annie, what are you thinking? She said that it sounds like something you will hear in a horror movie. In a horror movie, exactly. A sci-fi movie, right. Anybody else have any feedback you want to share? It's an um, idea of how aliens talk. That's right, our idea of how aliens talk. It's very high and nasal, buzzy, electronic. Okay, so that's F1, 2, and 3. We've heard all three of them separately now. The next link plays the sound of the three formants added together, basanga format, the gongzhen feng he zai qi. With this, the sentence becomes highly intelligible. Pretty clear? Okay, now they have two links here, and I'm not sure if I got exactly the right one. Let me see. Yep, that was the right one. Let's listen again. Okay, we don't like the lack of intonation, but it's still pretty clear. Okay? What do we have next? A slight improvement in quality occurs by adding some additional fixed formants which you can hear by playing the fifth link. What are they talking about here? Remember I told you that after F3, we also have F4, F5, F6, but what did I say about them? It's more about the shape of your skull and how big is your head. Things like that. Yeah, it's nothing to do with the vowels and comes with that word. That's right. They're not linguistically significant. However, if we add in some additional frequencies, we put in some more formant information, it will sound a bit more like human speech. It'll just make it sound more human. Rather than helping us distinguish the vowels, it'll just make it sound more like human speech. Well, let's see if they live up to what they're promising or suggesting. Here. Did that help? That helped quite a bit, didn't it? Okay, it's still flat and still buzzy and nasal, but that was the clearest one we've heard so far, isn't it? That's quite clear. I mean, I can understand it easily. At this point in the synthesis of the sentence, everything is there except the bursts of noise associated with the releases of the stop consonants and the turbulent noises of the fricatives. So what we've got here is vowels, just formants, that represent the vowels. That means for stops, we have to stop and have silence for, for a voiceless stop, right? And for fricatives, we have to have very high-pitched noise, right? It's missing those things. But if we add those in, then it will be even more intelligible than the ones we've heard so far. Okay. Um, okay, so this one has fricatives added in. <coughs> These are the fricatives by themselves. That's how they sound all by themselves, the fricatives all by themselves. <laughs> if we had only fricatives, that's what it would sound like. And I think the one that I want is this one. Let's try it. All right, did you hear the shh this time? Listen carefully for the fricatives. So, this time we're still hearing it in a monotone, but we've got the fricatives and stops added in. And the D was also quite clear. We've added in stops and fricatives. 
The sixth link enables you to hear the sounds of the bursts of noise and the turbulence of the fricatives by themselves. I did them out of order. Okay. When they are added in the correct places, as they are for the seventh link, you can hear the entire sentence in a monotone. The last link adds the what? We're going to get the fundamental frequency, finally, in this last link, which varies as the glottal pulses recur at different intervals so that the sentence is pronounced with a reasonable what? All right, this is going to sound much more normal because this thing that's been bothering us, this monotone speech, has been driving us nuts. So we're going to add in some intonation, and it should sound a lot better. Okay? <laughs> Suddenly jumped into life, right? Suddenly jumped to life. And it was, had a very strong British accent this time. We could, I could barely tell that it was a British accent until this one. A bird in the hand is worth two in the bush. I still hear an R, though. A bird in the hand is worth two in the bush. I hear an R in bird. Okay, they may have put, they may have put that in. I don't know. Okay, so we finished that. We finished that section. We can start on perturbation theory, and that is new. And since we're so close to quitting time, I'm just going to read through some of it. You're going to have to concentrate because this is new stuff and it's a bit technical. Perturbation, this means Luan. That means messing things up. Perturbation means interference, some kind of messing things up, interfering. We're interfering it, giving it some kind of obstacles in the way. Perturba uh, perturbation theory. We saw earlier with the formula Fn equals 2 times n minus 1 times speed of sound divided by four times the length of the vocal tract, right? We all remember that. That even a tube with a uniform diameter has simultaneous resonance frequencies. Remember when we saw that exploratorium demonstration? We had one bottle and then a very narrow passageway connected to another bottle connected to another one, right? Remember? We didn't have those when we were first using this formula. We didn't really have anything blocking the way. So what we came up with was, was, was a schwa. We get a schwa. Ta spontaneously However, Mm, okay, that was several different pitches at the same time. Furthermore, these resonance frequencies change in predictable ways when the tube is squeezed at various locations. When we squeeze the vocal tract into individual bottles connected by a little passageway. Everybody understands? Okay, 等于是我们会中间会压一下 Everybody understands that metaphor? This means that we can model the acoustics of vowels in terms of perturbations. That means we're messing up the very 整齐柱子 that we originally had. Guanzi is better than zhuzi. Zhuzi is solid. This is hollow of the uniform tube. For example, when the lips are rounded, the diameter of the vocal tract is smaller at the lips than at other locations in the vocal tract. So everybody say, ooh. You've got this tiny opening here, but we've got a larger diameter in the rest of your vocal tract, With perturbation theory, we know the acoustic effect of constriction at the lips, so we can predict the form and frequency differences between rounded and unrounded vowels. We've studied how rounding your lips, xiao xiao de, like that, will change the resonance properties of our tube. It's suddenly changing how the tube behaves because all of a sudden it got thinner here. It got much finer, much narrower, in one narrower. So it has We know how it works because we've studied what the lips do to this tube that we're talking about, our vocal tract. We're going to stop there. Everything's clear so far, right? Questions? Yes. You mean, yeah. Okay. I'm wondering, is that because um, fundamental, fundamental frequency has something related to, to the um, 
related to the industry mechanism so that it can produce the reasonable intonation? Yes. When we got the good intonation, the last one, that was completely fundamental frequency that we changed. Mm -hmm. Completely. Something between you know, something related to airstream mechanism. Well, it, it is in that it's just an ordinary pulmonic airstream mechanism. We're just breathing air out and it's making the vocal folds vibrate first at a regular rate, but later on we changed it. No, it doesn't really. We're not changing the airstream mechanism. It's just a plain pulmonic airstream. So we didn't change anything. All we changed was the rate of vibration. Sometimes, some is high. It's vibrating very fast. Times, it's vibrating very slow now. All we did was vary the rate of vibration according to the intonation we wanted to hear. So it was only varying the rate of vibration. We weren't changing the airstream mechanism. It will be coming out, okay. If it's a voiceless sound, it's gonna come out faster. If it's a voiced sound and the opening is very fine, it's gonna come out slower. So depending on the call and the frequency, the amount of air coming out will vary. But the important thing is we're controlling how fast it vibrates. That's the one thing. Did that clarify it? All right, anything else? That was a good question. Anybody else? We're all set? What do we have to do for Monday? You have your notes and you've got a new thing to answer. And I understand sort of Yumi's concern that this isn't really phonetics. Why are you spending our time on this? I understand that's totally valid question to ask. And I don't like wasting time, and if I tell you stories, it's only because I believe it's going to help you somehow doing what we're trying to do in this class. And that's, normally I will not take a whole hour of class unless I think it's very, very, very important. I was just, it was a big ton hun in freshman English. I've been teaching them now for one and a half semesters. And when that, when that student, she just constantly, and I said, well, just give me an answer. I'm not getting angry. I'm not yelling at you. Please just give me an answer. That did it. We had to have a talk. I'm sorry. And that tells me that because I've been reading about this anyway and we recently had that panel discussion, we're never going to get to the sophisticated parts of learning if we can't solve the basic parts first. I feel very, very strongly about that. And that's why I want all of you to think about it because even if you're not going to be a teacher in the future, you have to communicate with other people. You have to function in the workplace. All of you are going to get a job or you're going to start a business or you're going to do something. You have to be really aware of these and I assume all of you are going to be parents. I'm guessing all of you, probably, with, with Hen Shao, the Li Wai. You're going to be parents. So you're going to have to figure out how you want your children to learn and how you want them to react when the teacher says, uh, why are you late today, right? Do you want your kid to just go like this? So it's really important even for what we're doing here. Um, so for Monday, write your regular class notes plus Write what you think, any, any related topic on this that inspires you, because one day I guess you've already got your topic, right, that you want to write about is parents. Right. Now that's an excellent start because parents are a huge part of it. Um, whatever part of it inspires you, when you think about it, you connect to something that happened in your past, like the story the student told me about when in math class she asked a question, I didn't tell you that story? I remember I did, right? And then the teacher said, why weren't you paying attention? You know, you wouldn't have to ask the question if you're paying attention, remember? Okay, so whatever inspires you, if you think about it, think of your own previous experiences, think about what you've observed, think about things you think, why, is, why are we spending time on this, or why isn't anybody saying anything, why is it not a dialogue, why is it just one person talking all the time, whatever it is, whatever inspires you. Okay, and this has to start really early. This is, it's kind of late to try to change people when they're 19 years old. Um, well, it's not impossible, it's just harder. So your class notes, um, I want you to write very seriously, think deeply, think, put some real quality thought into it. You need to ding dong your test if you haven't done so and then bring that back on Monday. You need to work on vowels and consonants and go through the text to make sure you understand everything. Preview, use the CD, the CD-ROM that comes with your book. And can anybody think of anything else? Sophie, did I forget anything? That's it. We'll see you on Monday.